Welcome to the Respiratory System Basic Pathologies. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the Histology Wizard. In this tutorial, we'll discuss representative diseases that affect different parts of the respiratory tree, from the conducting zone to the respiratory zone. Although there are many diseases we could discuss, I've chosen pathologies where the histological changes are easier to visualize. Let's begin our tutorial at the top of the conducting zone with the trachea. Recall that the trachea has C-shaped hyaline cartilage rings that give the trachea the ability to resist compression but yet allow flexibility. But what happens if these rings are complete? In children who have complete tracheal rings, the trachea has one or more O-shaped rings. This is called congenital tracheal stenosis. Here's an image of a trachea with complete tracheal rings as seen via bronchoscopy. The affected airway can involve a few rings, most of the trachea, and can even extend into the lung. The resulting airway stenosis leads to children presenting with cyanosis, recurring infections, wheezing, apnea, and acute respiratory distress. Congenital tracheal stenosis is usually associated with other anomalies such as gastrointestinal, renal, or cardiovascular abnormalities, suggesting that the embryological defects occur early, perhaps within the fourth week of development. Milder forms likely arise between weeks 8 to 10 when the tracheal cartilage is developing, and this is thought to be from abnormal cartilage growth as opposed to muscular growth in the trachea. So what does this look like histologically? Here are two examples of complete tracheal rings, the first in an 11-year-old boy and another example from a 12-week-old baby presenting in respiratory distress. You can see that the cartilage looks pretty normal in both cases. Now, as I mentioned, usually this condition affects the trachea, but it can affect the large bronchi as well, and it is usually able to be treated surgically. Let's move down the respiratory tree to the bronchi and the bronchioles. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory process that's characterized by reversible narrowing of these airways, or bronchoconstriction. The classic symptoms of asthma are wheezing cough and shortness of breath or dyspnea. Asthma can be triggered by many different things, including repeated exposure to irritants or allergens, and these triggers can vary from person to person. In addition, aberrant regulation of airway function can cause asthma, and this can be caused by stress, exercise, illness, exposure to extreme weather conditions, or even medications. Now there are three main features of the hyperresponsive airway seen in asthma patients. The first is airway wall inflammation, and this involves neutrophils, mast cells, and macrophages. But most subtypes of asthma, especially allergic asthma, are characterized by high numbers of eosinophils that release products that contribute to the pathology. In fact, the latest research now shows that eosinophils may play a central role. In fact, recent research now shows that eosinophils may play a central role in the pathology of asthma. They stimulate smooth muscle, they stimulate goblet cell formation and mucus release, they stimulate epithelial cells, and they contribute to airway remodeling. Luminal obstruction and vasodilation also occur in asthma, which are illustrated here in this cartoon image on the right. Over time, the airways will undergo remodeling, which can add an irreversible component to this obstructive disease. The histological section on the right is from the lung of a patient with asthma. Pause the video and see whether you can identify changes in the features of this bronchial as compared to a normal bronchial. Then see whether you can link those structural changes to functional changes in a patient. Let's put this all together. First, you can observe hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the smooth muscle in the walls of the bronchial shown here and this contributes to the sudden constrictions of the smooth muscle called bronchiospasms. There's also a large number of inflammatory cells, including eosinophils, which contribute to this constriction. Next, you should observe that the epithelium contains increased numbers of goblet cells, and this leads to hypersecretion of mucus. There are also inflammatory cells in the epithelium. This leads to obstruction of the lumen by mucus, which is not obvious in this particular section. In asthma, there is often vasodilation of the microvasculature, so there is increased vascular permeability, which results in edema. Finally, you can see this ring of connective tissue around the bronchial, which contributes to the rigidity and inability of the airway to change diameters. Again, 
This is going to obstruct the airflow. The resulting difficulty in breathing from all of these changes can be mild to severe. Asthma is treated by drugs that relax this muscle and increase the bronchiolar diameter by stimulating sympathetic nervous system, while other drugs are used to target the underlying chronic inflammation of airway cells, and this includes targeting both eosinophil recruitment and activation. Let's look at another pathology of bronchioles. Recall that bronchiolar exocrine cells, or club cells, are unique to the bronchial. They secrete antimicrobial enzymes for local immune defense, they break down inhaled toxins, and they secrete surfactant-like substances. They also serve as stem cells. Defects in these cells, either in function or loss of the cells, can lead to obliterative or constrictive bronchiolitis, which is characterized by progressive airflow obstruction. However, the pathophysiology of this disease is not completely understood. These bronchioles on the right show a reduction in the lumen due to inflammatory cell infiltrates and obstructive fibrosis. The diverse medical conditions and exposures that result in this disease suggest that it may be actually a final common pathway in which various insults lead to similar microscopic, physiological, and clinical results. Now let's move on into the respiratory zone. The chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases are characterized by progressive and often irreversible airflow limitations. Emphysema is characterized by irreversible enlargement of the air spaces distal to the terminal bronchial, and this is accompanied by destruction of their walls without obvious fibrosis. Based on the segments of the respiratory units that are involved, emphysema is classified into four major types, but only two, Centroacinar and panacinar cause clinically significant airflow obstruction. Centroacinar emphysema is the most common form, and this is where the central or more proximal parts of the acini, those formed by respiratory bronchioles, are affected. This type of emphysema occurs predominantly in heavy smokers, often in association with chronic bronchitis. A number of different factors can contribute to emphysema. Smoking and inhaled pollutants can cause ongoing accumulations of inflammatory cells that release elastases and oxidants which destroy the alveolar walls, and that includes the elastic tissue that normally holds these small airways open. The loss of this tissue causes the respiratory bronchioles to collapse during expiration, and this causes a functional airflow obstruction. Advanced emphysema often produces huge lungs that often overlap the heart. Histologically, Abnormally large alveoli are separated by thin septa with only minimal fibrosis. There's loss of attachments of the alveoli to the outer wall of the small airways. The pores of Kuhn are so large that the septa appear to be floating or protruding blindly into the alveolar spaces with this club-shaped end. Now, as the alveolar walls are destroyed, there's a decrease in the capillary bed surface area. And with advanced disease, there are even larger abnormal air spaces and changes in the vasculature of the lung. And all of this together leads to a reduction in gas exchange. Finally, let's look at an alveolar cell pathology. Recall that surfactant is a, lip is a lipid substance produced by type 2 alveolar cells, and it functions to reduce the surface tension at the air fluid interface. And surfactant is produced around 35 weeks of gestation. Insufficient quantity of surfactant due to incomplete differentiation of type 2 cells in premature infants can cause neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. In the newborn, this deficiency will cause the lungs to collapse with each breath. The resulting hypoventilation causes too much retention of carbon dioxide, and then hypoperfusion leads to endothelial cell damage. The damage triggers a fibrin-rich exudation into the alveolar space, forming a hyaline membrane that leads to more carbon dioxide retention. And in this image, you can see the characteristic pink hyaline membrane lining the alveoli, clearly impeding gas exchange. All right, there we have a few examples of respiratory pathology that I hope will give you an idea of how histological changes can contribute to respiratory symptoms. Thanks for stopping by.